don't know who you are, but welcome to the Irish Photography Podcast. Sit back, relax, and listen about cameras, gear, settings, stories, and all things photography. Join Dermot and Darren on Ireland's Best Photography Podcast. Let's go. And you're very welcome to episode 171 of the Irish Photography Podcast. My name is Darren, I'm your host, and I'm delighted, excited and thrilled to have a conversation with somebody this evening whose work I think you will all know, but it's actually taken me a long time, my own doing, to get him finally on the podcast. He's a very busy man and I'm so grateful he's taken the time. Welcome to the Irish Photography Podcast, Fabian Wagner. How are you doing, buddy? I'm very well, man. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. And um, yeah, it's great to be finally here. Yeah, it's been a long time coming. I think it was over a year ago I first reached out to you, actually, and you were very courteous to go, yeah, no problem. And then I just didn't do anything about it. And I said, he's busy. I leave him alone. I leave him alone. And now you're finally here. I'm really excited to share the conversation with everybody that's going to listen to this, because I think you're going to have a different story to any guest that I've ever had in the past. You're episode 171, and I'm really, really looking forward now to getting into the nitty gritty, the nuts and bolts about what you do for a living on a daily basis. Let's do it. Let's do it. So I suppose before we even get into all of that, Fabian, tell people, who is Fabian? <laughs> Well, I'm just, I think, I hope I'm just a normal guy from uh, from Bavaria originally. Okay. I was born in Munich and, um, yeah, I mean, very early on wanted to get into the film industry. I've been, I didn't have any connections to film industry as such. Not my family, none of my family was uh, in the industry, but I just had a love for films from a very early age. Mm -hmm. uh, and my dad, who was an artist, he, uh, I guess, kind of inspired me a little bit with his painting. He was he was a painter, um, and he also took a lot of stills. Okay. Um, and, and so I guess that's probably something that kind of, you know, got me into photography and, and images, not just photography, but but paintings and drawing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. From a very early age, and I, and, I, and I was always very fascinated by that. And um, it turns out a few years later that my best friend Nick, who still is my best friend, um, wanted to become a director. So when we were like 12, 13, 14, we started shooting. Wow. You know, he was directing stuff, and I started to shoot with him. And um, yeah, we just did that. And uh, when I was 15 or 16, I think it was 16, I did a um, internship at Ari in Munich. Okay. Yeah, Ari um, Alexa, the camera company. Yeah, the camera yeah. company. So uh, Munich is actually their headquarters, their company from Munich. That's handy. And um, so I did an internship there, which was a which was a mind blowing experience. Um, you know, working in the camera department, obviously not, not knowing anything, but but the guys who worked there. There was three, four guys there, and they were just incredible wizards with like lenses and, and mm -hmm. cameras, and it was a re really exciting time for me. And and after that, I started to um, to work on short films, mainly for in the beginning for the Munich Film School. Okay. They were always looking for free laborers. Yes, of course. Um, so yeah, I started. Started doing everything. Started, uh, I, I did everything from um, being a trainee or assistant in the art department to a, to a runner to a, um, you know every every single department. I think I went through for a while, sort of just uh, experiencing and exploring the industry and and, and how it all works pr properly, and um, eventually found myself in the lighting department. As a okay. trainee, mm -hmm. got taken on by a, by an older gaffer. Um, I guess because I was bugging him so much with questions. <laughs> yeah, and you were hungry and passionate to very, learn more. Very passionate, yeah. Yeah, and um, yeah, so he he took me on, and I I did that for a little bit, and um, it was a great time. I had I had lots of fun. I was finishing my high school at the same time. I was hiding 
working in the film industry from my parents because wow. they didn't approve at the time. Wow. Um, it was quite a tumultuous but very fun time. And then uh, when I finally, when, the, when I did my Abitur, which is like the high school diploma mm -hmm. in Germany, I, I, I sort of, um, yeah, just continued working um, until I finally applied to a film college in Denmark called the European Film School. Uh, in between that, I also applied to the German, to the Munich Film School. Mm -hmm. um, I got through the first two or three rounds, but in the last round, they turned me down. Wow. Um, so that was quite a blow back then. I remember being very disappointed at the time. Um, and, and this was all when you were in your teenage years, yeah? This was when I was, this was when I was at 19. Wow. So I must have been 19 then, 19, yeah. Um, and so that was them turning me down uh, was a big blow, but it was a very difficult film school to always get into. Okay. And um, I always have said since then that it was actually the best thing that ever happened to me. The fact that it didn't take me, mm -hmm. um, to me personally, turned out to be the, the best thing that happened to me because it meant that I actually suddenly expanded my view uh, of where else I could go, mm, mm. which I hadn't sort of thought of before as much. And so suddenly other countries and places came into my vision and deep down I always knew that I didn't really want it. I didn't really want to stay in Germany. I wanted to go somewhere and, else and, yeah. and, and be in a different country. So... And see the world, I suppose, and get exposure to different views as well and different yeah, methods exactly. and people yeah, and such like that. Exactly. That was always something I really much enjoyed was, you know, meeting different people from different backgrounds, different cultures. Um, and, and so so Denmark came into view and, and you know, I didn't want to be too far away from my parents because we had a very good relationship. Mm -hmm. My dad wasn't very well at the time as well. So, you know, I didn't want to sort of go to America. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be able to still be able to come home. Sure. Um, and so I went to Denmark, I uh, did my diploma there at the film school, which was one of the best times I've ever had. It was, a, it was a great time I've had there and I learned a lot of stuff and made lots of friends. Um, and it's actually the film school that I still go to, go back to every year. Wow. Uh, once a year to, um, to do like a masterclass or so. So it's a very nice place to go to. I have very fond memories of that place. And let uh, me let, let, let me sorry to, let me ask you. I suppose during that time when you decided that you wanted to, you know, go to Denmark, you wanted to learn how to do this right. You applied in Germany. You didn't get that. Okay, I'm going to go to Denmark now. What was it that drove you? Like, was there a defining moment in your younger years and said, "You know what? I love this so much. I want to do this forever." Because we all kind of start with all things kind of start with a bit of a hobby aspect. We try things, we get things wrong. But what was the was there a point where you went? this is for me and to push you on to do that further. Yeah. You know, I don't, that's a very good question. I, I, I don't think there ever was a point where it wasn't. <laughs> you know, <I> <laughs> it was always written in the stones, as they from, say. From the moment I, I understood that there was a career to be had or there was never any other thought in my head. Wow. That there was something else that I could do. And and there was obstacles in my way. Like, for example, I said that my parents didn't approve. Mm -hmm. um, for example, they, my mom was from, from a very conservative background. She was very, she didn't know the industry at all. Um, so she was very much against it. My dad, who I always thought would support me because he, he himself was an artist, mm -hmm. um, he actually was against it too because he, and I only kind of understood this later on in life, but he just wanted to prevent me from, he knew how hard it would be, how yeah. hard it can be to be an yeah. artist. And so I think he just wanted me not to do this because he didn't want me to have a hard time, if you know what yeah. I mean. To, to protect you, basically. To protect me, basically. And obviously yeah. I didn't see that when I was young. But there was a, there was a, there was about a year where they, they were so adamant that I should be doing something proper <laughs> with my mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. um, and, and in my mom's eyes, I was studying law. I actually enrolled <clears throat> into university after okay. high school to study law. And I remember I went there, I think, twice. On, I went on the first day to enroll and to start the year. 
and then I had friends studying law at the same time. So I used to I used to go off and work on film sets, okay. and then ask my friends about what did you study today? Wow, because my grandpa was a judge, so he was very much not of law. So I had to come home and be like, well, today we studied uh, paragraph 122. Wow, um, you know civil law, whatever, it, it was yeah. hilarious. So for, for about a year, I, I kept up that kind of facade of wow. and basically lying to my parents of what I was doing, but I was actually working on film sets every single day. And it was, it, it was kind of a very strange time because I had a good relationship with my parents. I didn't really want to lie to them, but I also mm -hmm. didn't want to disappoint them. So there was a huge struggle going on inside of me. And so that's how this whole film school thing in Denmark came came about at the, at the end is because I basically said to myself, if I, if I get into this film school, I'm going to tell my parents the truth and say, look, this is what I really want to do. And I got into this film school. And if I would, didn't get in, I would go back to studying law. And thankfully I got into the film school and told my parents the truth. I'll never forget that day. Um, they did look very shocked. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Um, but, but, you know, I guess they kind of finally had to, admit that, okay, I'm, I seem very committed to this and, and getting to the film school seemed like some thing of a, you know, of a good thing for them. At least it was a, a film school. It was a diploma, which I think mm -hmm. seemed important to them. So, you know, that's what I did. And let, let me ask you, I suppose, um, did you, like you say when your father being an artist, did you start with the, the still image or did you move straight to film right from the get-go? Was there an evolution there in your own skill set? Yeah, I don't think I can call it a skill set <laughs> back okay. in those days. <laughs> but it was certainly a passion. I definitely started with stills. I was taking a lot of stills, first with my dad's camera and then with, you know, other cameras and I acquired throughout the, you know, and then, you know, it, it was sort of a natural progression, I suppose, you know. Okay. Okay. And then I suppose from the film point of view, then, you know, I think the, the, the diversity that you have from film is something that, you know, is unique to film. But you've worked on a number of things, I suppose, in the early part of your career. You said, you know, helping out, doing with your friends and such like that. Was there specific things that you would have worked on? Did you work on friends like in a videos? Did you work on official music videos? Did you work on different types of commercials? What were some of the things that you started off on? Was that true that when you were in Denmark or was it before, or during and after? I mean, I think it was before, during, and after. I mean, you know, before that, we did a lot of short films. We did, you know, short little spots and kind of just made up stories or, mm -hmm. you know, anything from 30 seconds to, you know, 10 minutes. I mean, it was just a very creative time. And then after Denmark, I came back to Germany to um, to work as an assistant uh, I became a camera assistant. Okay. Um, and at the same time was also still trying to shoot my own stuff and, you know, doing lots of different things. Um, and then I decided that I don't want to work in Germany. I want to work in an English speaking country. Okay. Um, and I decided to uh, move to the UK again because right. of, uh, I guess I, I, I kind of wanted to move to, America, but again, that was too far away from me from my family. So the UK was sort of close enough, but with a very rich history of, of good films and good actors. Mm -hmm. and so I applied to the film school in Leeds, the Northern Film School, um, and got into that and then uh, moved to Leeds, moved to the UK. And, and while you were in the UK then, you were able to kind of suppose, you know, get more into paying jobs, I imagine, at that stage. You know, as you started to work on um, proper um, commercial videos and, and, and music videos for artists, I imagine, then during that stage, was it? Uh, well, it took, a, it took a while, you know. I was, um, I did my master's at the film school. That took two years. Okay. Uh, I met some really interesting, creative and great people there. Um, and we started to work together. We did lots of music videos and short films and, and all sorts of stuff. And at the, at the end of my master's, at the end of the film school, I was a bit of a, a, bit of a crossroads as in that I was 
pretty much broke okay. and um, I had to decide on either going back to Germany or staying in the UK and finding a job that probably necessarily wasn't a job that I really wanted to do, but I decided that I wanted to stay and there was a company that was looking, a corporate company that was looking for in-house, for an in-house cameraman. Right. And they were doing terrible corporate videos, um, mainly for supermarkets. Okay. Uh, on, you know, f mainly for the new employees, and there, it was corporate videos of uh, induction you know, videos. Yeah. Yeah, of how to how to stack the shelves with vegetables or whatever. Yeah. Videos that they would show to the new employees, and I thought, well, at least I would have a camera on my shoulder, and at least I would make some money. Yeah. And so I applied to the job and had a meeting. And even though they thought I was totally overqualified, um, they took me on and I took the job and I ended up shooting these corporate videos for a year, which was definitely not what I wanted to do. Uh -huh. But um, I did have a camera on my shoulder every day. Yeah. It, it gave me, I had to communicate with um, a different sort of, set of people every single day in the corporate world. Mm -hmm. uh, so it did give me some skills in that sense. And it made me feel very comfortable with communicating with people of, of different backgrounds. And, and, um, and also the other thing was that it, it was a company of, um, there was probably about 25 people working in the company at that time. We had editors, in-house editors and, and in-house sound mixers and everything. And, Luckily, it was just an interesting time as in that there was about five or six or seven people in that company of a similar age, maybe a little bit older, mm -hmm. but we all wanted to do other stuff. And so I said to the company boss, I said, look, if I come and shoot those corporate videos for you every single day, Monday to Friday, I will do that. But how about can I use your cameras on the weekends mm -hmm. for my own stuff? Mm -hmm. And they said, yes. Brilliant. And so suddenly I had this job that I suddenly had equipment there that I could use. And so we ended up shooting every weekend, doing music videos for bands that we knew, doing just doing all sorts of stuff, just learning, you know, and experimenting and, and having fun. Mm -hmm. And um, while I was still working at the company, I started to sort of branch out a little bit and started to sort of get my name around in leads uh, for other stuff and eventually after about a year I left the company uh, they were very good to me um, and let me go very easily and I sort of started doing some second unit on TV shows mm -hmm. you know or went in to do like additional photography um, and at that time I started doing some music videos um, one of my friends, Mark Wordsworth, who's a very creative, talented director, he started to get some, he was from the film school too. You know, we always worked together at the film school. Mm -hmm. He started to get a couple of paid music videos at the time that we did together. And so things just very slowly started to progress, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and also, I suppose, thinking about that, you, you mentioned something earlier on there about you know, it gave you a skill set to be able to be comfortable around and telling people what needed to be done and directing people and such like that. Um, when you're in a environment, you know, you're you're filming, I imagine, at this stage. Yeah. So you're not uh, progressing into further roles when you're with Mark, for example. He's the director. Are you in a DOP role then? Or are you still behind the camera at that stage? Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. So so with, with that in mind, you know, there's an, a, a number of things that I'm interested in is that how did you progress away from there? Like you said to yourself, okay, I have a craft. How am I going to perfect this craft? Is it perfecting making the film or did you find the leap to say, you know what? I can, this guy, he's a very good cameraman, but I actually can set things up here and make it all work for my director. What, what at what stage did that happen? Cool. I think that's still happening. <laughs> so so it, it never ends I think that never ends I think that's a very long process yeah uh, you know I think you know 
back then and and still you know you you, you learn every day mm-hmm. you know every single job that you do no matter what the job is how big or small or you know there's always something new that you learn and that you want to learn and and i think that's great you know so i don't think mm-hmm. that ever i don't think that ever ends um at one time there's no real cutoff point i think you're right in that because we are always always going to be learning if you're not learning you're not improving exactly you're not improving and i think you know you need to you know i think learning keeps us interested and keeps us pushing ourselves yes and you know i think when it comes to I think anyone who says they don't have anything else to learn, I think they're lying. But I also think, I think if you ever came to the point of saying, I don't have anything more to learn, I think that would be the time to actually stop what you're doing. Give up. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. I would agree with that entire entirely. I think because even if you think in the last 15 years, 10 years, five years, look at the progression in technology that has come along. Look how we do things now than we did 15 years ago, 10 years ago, and five years ago. And if you believe 15 years ago that you knew it all, you're a dinosaur because you're not going to evolve, you're going to die. You know, So I think you have to constantly be up with the trends, learn new things, and improve by making mistakes, I imagine, particularly when we're starting off. You know, I think, is that something that you still find relevant to this day? Yeah, I think it, I think it was a combination of all of those things, you know, obviously, we didn't have anyone to answer to. Um, but I think it's all, you know, maybe it's because we, we were young, and we were like, you know, full of dreams. And like, I, I think we were just innocent, you know, I think we just had this very innocent dream and we were all at the same stage of like just wanting to make films and wanting to have fun and and it was just a a very creative and like fun time like i literally i think back on it very fondly a lot and i suppose you know when you mentioned there that you then moved in and you got you know um into the film and the TV series industry uh, and your second unit and such like that. How did you feel going into that? It's now a real job. It's something that I've always wanted to do. Was there uh, a nervous energy going into it or was it just pure excitement getting into that? Well, interestingly, and I think, I think about this quite a lot because I get asked this quite a lot. Okay. And there wasn't anything like that. I mean, I was obviously excited. You know, the more stuff that I was doing, I was excited about it. But there mm-hmm. wasn't, I don't think I was ever nervous as such. I had done this, I'd been in this industry for such a long time by then already, doing mm-hmm. so many different things. And whether it was, you know, paid or unpaid or whatever, I kind of, Obviously, I didn't know what I was doing, mm-hmm. um, but I knew that this is where where I am, and this is where I wanted to be, and this is where I should be. If you know what I mean, yes. Like I had yeah, this kind yeah. of innocent sort of. It wasn't cockiness, or it wasn't like um, arrogance. It was just a. I had this sort of innocent belief that this is what I'm doing. Belief in myself. And that energy. Yes. And that energy will bring you through as well to enable you to deliver. Yes, I think so. Yeah. I had I had always I think I always had a very positive energy and you know, I always had fun and mm-hmm. so yeah, it's it's a kind of a strange thing because it it never felt I never felt overwhelmed, whether it was, you know, I mean, I remember, you know, when I was doing, when I was doing, I was working at the company doing corporate videos. And I remember, remember that, um, I came onto a job to operate the B camera for a day. Mm -hmm. And it was a fairly big TV drama and we shot on 16 mil. And I remember the assistant the camera assistant, who's now one of my best friends, 
um, he always said to me that when you came onto a job on day one, this was literally my first job on a TV show ever. You know, it just felt like you had always been there. Yeah. Like the way I handled myself, the way I handled everything else, you know, and it wasn't like I said, with an arrogance, it was just sort of a natural kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I think that's, so I never thought about it. It just happened. I, I think that's very interesting, actually, Fabian, because, you know, we can all kind of hold ourselves back if we uh, have a fear of something. But if we're feeling that, you know what, I'm going to do this and I know what I'm doing and I'm going to enjoy it and have fun, then invariably you end up having fun because, you know, what you think about it is becomes a self-fulfilling pro- prophecy. So if I go in there and said, you know what, I know how to use the camera, I know how to do this, I know it's about lighting, let's have fun and let's let's get the job done. It puts other people at ease as well, I imagine. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so working within there, and I suppose I'm getting on to the, kind of the, 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 the nitty-gritty of certain items here, so... Um, I alluded to it at the very beginning, but the first thing I want to talk about is your first Emmy nomination. I mean, you got that for the work on Sherlock. And I mean, firstly, like I said, that's that's a huge achievement and congratulations in relation to getting that. But secondly, how did that journey come about? And then when when you got the um, the Emmy nomination, how did that feel? Well, that's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how it has it been out? asked before? I, I felt I felt very upset that people that asked the last question before. So has this one been asked before? <laughs> no, I don't think it has. I mean, you know how it came about is I have no idea. I mean, I was just you know th- there was a long time between that and the, the the last question. You know, I mean, there was you know four four years in between of me working very very hard uh honing your craft yeah and sort of you know doing you know uh, you know i was working a lot at that time i was um lucky enough to be shooting you know um f- especially for kudos kudos was a big company back then doing lots of different programs like um you know, BBC One kind of primetime shows like Spooks and Hustle and The Fixer and Ashes to Ashes and Life on Mars. And they were a very loyal company and I did one job for them, which they were very happy with. Uh, and Karen Wilson, who was working at Spooks, uh, at, at um, one of the execs at Kudos, she was very, very good to me. Um, and, and the company sort of rotated me throughout their shows. And, and I did all of those shows within a few years, you know, and I was constantly working and, and it was a huge learning ground for me. You know, I, I was mm-hmm. with different directors all the time, met different crews, met different film crews. Um, and I learned a lot about shooting multiple cameras, you know, we were shooting 16 mil, 35 mil uh, on tight TV schedules. And, and it, was a, it, it was great fun and it was a great learning curve. And uh, at that time, I also met, you know, some of my closest collaborators, my focus puller, Jamie Phillips, who's been with me for, well, since 2009, um, and has now stepped up to operating finally. Um, So I've lost him, but, um, you know, he's become one of my closest collaborators and and a very good friend of mine over the years. Um, Mm -hmm. I met all of those people back then. And, you know, again... I, I never thought, I never had a plan. I just sort of naturally went from job to job and and luckily, um, you know, job, job slowly got bigger and, and, and more interesting. And, and at some point, um, I got Sherlock, which was none of my doing. It was, I still don't quite know how it happened, but I think I must have been recommended to the producers by another producer because I had a phone call to meet Paul McGuigan, the director, and he, he didn't know me. He hadn't asked for me. He, the producers recommended me to him. We met, we had a chat and I got the job. So 
you know, I don't quite know how that came about, but that was a big, that was a big uh, career changer for me. And I, to be perfectly honest, at the time, I didn't see that. I didn't, I didn't realize that. I never thought of that even. Like I, I wasn't the kind of person looking for career changing projects as such. I just, I was very happy working. I was very um, content mm-hmm. doing what I was doing. I didn't have um, necessarily this kind of master plan of saying like, okay, now I'm, now I need to like do a film or now I need to do this or that. I kind of just, you know, I was just happy being busy. And, and mm-hmm. so at that time I didn't actually even think like, oh, this could be, you know, this would be a really great show to do. I just met Paul and I was like, yeah, that's, that's another job. Let's go and do it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's another job that turned into something bigger than you could possibly have imagined so because you had no uh, um, expectations let's just say for it right from the outset yeah i didn't and and it's i mean it's it's not only a job that kind of i mean I, i'd have to say now that's really the job that has set me on to my career path that i am that, that i'm on right now but it was also um the job that was probably the closest to shooting like those short films and things back in the early days, Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. it was still, I would say one of the most creative jobs I've ever done. Um, one of the trickiest, but also one of the most fun ones. Um, Paul and I struck up a very great, um, personal and professional relationship and friendship, well, friendship, um, after that, um, and we worked together for a long time. Um, and he's a director that I'm very fond of. Um, and so, so that, that job itself without me knowing or thinking even about that when we were doing it became a huge, a huge thing in my career. Mm -hmm. And where were you and how did you get the news of the Emmy nomination? Uh, I, remember that clearly I was in I was in Swansea shooting a show called Da Vinci's Demons um, okay. with David Goya I was actually on the I was actually on the golf course um, <laughs> okay I was prepping I think and I, I, I managed to f- leave prep early and I went to the driving range or something I can't remember and that's when I had the phone call and, and did did you hit the ball after that? Did you <laughs> miss the ball after that? Did you take a moment to go, what the heck is after happening here? You know, I actually I actually can't remember what I did. I don't think I reacted much because I don't oh. actually think I quite understood what a big thing the Emmy was. Okay. But what I do remember is that maybe an hour later, I called my mom up. Uh-huh. And I yes. called her and I... I think that was the moment for her. And she had been, you know, she had come to visit me on film sets in the years before that. Um, And she had obviously seen that I had kind of made a, somehow a career out of it. And, you know, I must be loving what I'm doing and I seem to be fairly okay at it. But that was the moment I think for her when everything changed and she finally accepted and, you know, accepted it completely, basically, and, and, and was, I guess it made her proud. And and so then for me, it sunk in that this is actually a big thing. Yes, and, and you know what, it's interesting because one of the questions that I wanted to ask you as well is how has the world of filmmaking and photography influenced you and your nearest and dearest to date? And that's a perfect example of, you know, when you go full circle, um, you know, you you started off and you were doing this was your passion. You didn't want to tell them. Then all of a sudden you did tell them. And now it's coming back and going, well, look, guess what? I'm not saying that I'm great, but people think that I'm great. And your mom is so proud, I imagine, at that stage to say, this is amazing for you. Yeah. Yeah, she was she was very, very happy. She was yeah. very, very happy. And that, and, that, and that for me was the nicest, you know, the nicest thing. And um and I actually took her to LA for a whole week. We, her and me, we did a whole trip to LA brilliant. together and I took her to the Emmys oh, and, uh, and we had a great week. 
And, and, and you know, that the, the whole filming world has changed your world as well completely. I mean, you said you wanted to, you know, not be in Germany and you wanted to see the world. I mean, you probably have seen the four corners of the world, the invariable or whichever you want to call it, the virtual corners of the world at this stage, yeah? Um, yeah, I mean, that's so sort of at that time was sort of when, I was, when it started. I was working mostly in, the, in Europe and in the UK uh, up to that point. But once I had the Emmy nomination, um, things really opened up for me. And, and Paul McGuigan played a big part in that as he, he took me to the States quite a lot to do shoot pilots. And, um, and yeah, so after that, it really kind of opened up. You, you were on the map and the spot and the spotlight was on you. Well, I don't think the spotlight was on me, but I didn't, I didn't win <laughs> the, I didn't win the Emmy. So, but, um, you were nominated, That's but no, it was definitely, you know, and, and the, the, one of the funny stories about that was that I actually probably about three, four months before the Emmy nominations came out, I actually went to LA, um, I did my first big LA trip and I set up lots of meetings with agencies and um, I met all the agencies. I was there for about 10 days. I think I met all the agencies and it was a, you know, it's a big thing for, you know, going to LA for the first time, you know, the dream. Mm -hmm. three, it's quite a funny, funny thing. And, and you go into, I went to all these agents and met them all and they were all saying the same thing. They all said, you know, you're a really nice young guy and you know, you've got, an interesting showreel and I could tell that they hadn't even watched my showreel um, <laughs> and why don't we just keep talking? It's not right right now, but let's, you know, maybe let's see in a few years time, blah, blah, blah. And so I came back from LA being very disappointed and disheartened thinking, you know, well, here I was thinking I would come back with an agent in, in America and I didn't. Mm -hmm. And then uh, a couple of months later, the Emmy nominations came out and the following morning, my phone didn't stop ringing and it was every <laughs> single agent that I went to see. And they all said, Oh, do you remember us? I know that we said we're going to maybe see you in a few years time, but actually we'll take you on now. <laughs> so, so from that point of view it was also very really helpful. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you know what? It's been remarkable to hear, you know, how you have gone from starting off right at the very beginning and all the way through to where you, you know, created the recognition of not only your passion, but also now these agencies in the US that are looking for you as opposed to you looking for them. And I think I've really, really enjoyed Fab and you telling me uh, in relation to the early days. What I want to do is I want to take a very, very quick break and then I want to come back and I want to get into some really interesting projects that you've worked on over the last number of years. So we'll take a quick break and be right back after this. If you're enjoying this episode of the podcast, why not jump over to iTunes or Spotify and listen to the back catalogue that we have of some great episodes where we talk about photography, gear, and some excellent guests along the way. Thanks very much for listening and for watching. We'll see you on the next one. And you're very welcome back to the Irish Photography Podcast. So Fabian, like I said from the outset here in the, in the last part, I want to get into the main details now in regards to your career over the last number of years. And following on the back of your successes with the Emmy nomination, at age 34, you became one of the youngest members of the British Society of Cinematographers. Tell us about this. Yeah, that was a great day. <laughs> that was like a... Uh, that was a... Good, that was a good day. I mean, again, you know, I just never, you know, like I said early on, like I never had any expectations. I never had any plan. You know, I know people who are like, okay, I need to do this. I, want, I, I need to do a film before I'm 30. I need to become a member of this. I need to do this. I've never had those kind of ambitions. I never had those kind of, this sort of aspirations. Aspira well, I mean, I'm, I'm a very ambitious person, but I just never had these, specific goals that I necessarily specific. had to follow, you know, like I said, it just kind of developed all naturally in a way. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's obviously nice when those things happen, um, especially when you don't expect them at all, you know? And so when they called me and they said that they would like me to become a member, it was just like, wow, okay, that's a huge recognition and a huge, um, you know, honor to be picked out, you know, to become a member in a, in a society that is that old and that kind of, you know, um, 
recognized and admired. So yeah, that was, that was amazing. And it's a phenomenal achievement. I mean, you know, as you said, that you didn't have aspirations in relation to potentially that. But as you quite rightly said here, there's many of your peers that you've worked with and met over the years that would say, you know what, I'd love to be recognized by, you know, BSC. And now you have been there and then. And I think it's now helped you as well even further to recognize your skill set because you were Emmy nominated. And then you become the youngest, one of the youngest members of the uh, British Society of Cinematographers. An amazing thing to do. Did that help you then to be able to get onto some of the next projects that you worked on? And one I want to talk about, which is Game of Thrones. You started to work in Game of Thrones. You joined in the fourth season. Was that on the back of what you had from the uh, British Society of Cinematographers? No, I mean, you know, I don't know how much those things help to get jobs. I mean, I certainly, I think when you do bigger jobs, they certainly maybe help because maybe studios or feel a bit more at ease if they have someone who has letters behind their names. I don't okay. think that's true at all. I think there's an, there's amazing cinematographers out there who aren't recognized by those societies, unfortunately. And some also who don't want to be part of those societies. So um, I don't think that definitely didn't help me. I mean, what helped me um, with Game of Thrones was Sherlock. It's as simple as that. Okay. I was shooting in Vancouver at the time. I was doing a pilot and I had a phone call from my agent saying, hey, um, there's a show in Ireland, Game of Thrones, and David and Dan, the showrunners, they want to meet you. Hmm. And I hadn't seen the show. <laughs> what? I wow. hadn't seen Game of Thrones. I knew, I heard of it. I knew that it was kind of big, but I hadn't seen it. I hadn't watched it. I didn't know what it, is, what it was about. I didn't know that people liked it. I just was like, again, in the same, I was in the same mindset that I always was. And I was like, yeah, great. That's a job. Okay, let's talk mm -hmm. to them. And I had a, I had a, we set up a Zoom call, I think, while I was filming. I think it was my lunch break in the trailer. We were shooting in some hospital, I think, in Vancouver. And I just remember that the reception was really bad, so the Zoom didn't work. And we just ended up talking on the phone for five minutes. And they said, hey, man, we really love your Sherlock episode, Scandal in Belgravia. Um, we think it would be great if you can come and join us for season four. And I said, yeah, great. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> and um, as, as easy as that. Yeah, let's sure, do yeah it. sure. Why and not? That was <laughs> wow. And, and did you, and little did you know at that point in time that joining Game of Thrones for the fourth season would earn you your second Emmy nomination? It certainly didn't. I certainly didn't know that. I mean, I, I then started to watch some of the um, episodes and obviously realized, okay, this was a big show. This was a big setup. Um, uh -huh. This was a very, very interesting show, very good setup, you know, visually, you know, obviously as soon as I saw it, I thought, okay, this is, this looks great. This, this is something very different to what I've done. Um, and yeah, I went to, went to um, Belfast and, um, And that was it and started shooting and met David and Dan. We go on very well. Um, and then I think, yes, season, I think season four, that was, I had another Emmy nomination for one of those episodes. I think, yes, I think it was, wow. tr was it the trial? I can't remember. It was one of the amazing episodes that you obviously, you know, was in charge of that got you that Emmy nomination, no doubt, yeah? I'd remember, I'd remember the precise name of it, but you probably have... How, how, many, epi how, many, how many episodes was there? Uh, ten episodes in season four? Ten episodes in season four. I'd have to look it up. I think from memory. I think there was around ten on average in each of them. It was a bit more, I can't recall. Um, well, it was, but I mean, it was 10, 10. Yeah. So like, that's something again, that puts you even further uh, up the scale. Let's just say in regards to your ability, because you know, you're now on the biggest show on TV. You've gotten the 
second Emmy nomination in relation to from the previous one, which you said, okay, I was amazed at. Now you've got a second recognition in regards to that. Did that change in how you approached your craft thereafter? Or did you just continue like you always have is, hey, it's a job? No, I think I just continued like I always have. I seem to remember that the episode that I was nominated for, I was actually surprised that I was nominated for the episode because I didn't think it was that good. Wow. Um, wow. Well, yeah, to be honest, I, I, I loved Game of Thrones and I think everything about it, there was so many things within that nuances that I would spot and go, oh my God, look at that. That's incredible. And there was a number of episodes as well that really, really stood out to me out of all the seasons. But there's one particular that really stood out to me. And then I learned that you're responsible for it. And it is the scene, which is the Battle of the Bastards. What an incredible scene. How how did you do it? How, how, how much work was involved in putting that together? I mean, there was, a lot of, there was a lot of work involved. The funny thing is that I did season four, and then season five, I came back and I met Mikhail Sapochnik. Um, I was meant to actually shoot with a different director. They asked me okay. to come back for season five, and they wanted to do Hard Home, which was a big episode, the biggest kind of episode they'd done to that point. And they had this action director who they wanted to pair me up with, and the director actually pulled out fairly close to prep. And so Miguel Sapochnik came in, kind of short notice, and we met and started to work together, and we just hit it off together. We um, we got on very well from the moment we met, and we did two episodes together, and one was Hard Home, which was a very difficult episode to do, and also became one, a very successful episode. And so when that happened, you know, they asked us both to come back as a team to do <clears throat> the biggest episode they ever done, they said, for season six, which was Battle of the Bastards. And so we said, yeah, we'll come and do that together. And so, you know, it, it, Battle of the Bastards was a, was a difficult thing to figure out, but it was also, you know, Miguel and I had worked together for the year before on season five. We had really gotten to know each other. Um, we were really working well together. And so it kind of almost felt like a natural progression from Hard Home to Battle of the Bastards. And, and um, yeah, it was great. We had a lot of fun. And again, I never, never even once thought when we were shooting that or making it that that would ever become so big and so successful. Ah, it was, it, it was visually spectacular, immersive. I mean, the the sound design, even the whole lot, everything. It just all worked perfectly. And I just have a question for you in relation to it: is that a lot of this, the 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 frames were close up frames of the actors, in what seems like extremely difficult filming with dark darkness and such like that. How was that done with with the cameras being so close to them? With was, was there how many people were there? Was there as many people there as it seemed visually watching the episode? Yeah, I mean, we had, you know, we were shooting on a field outside Belfast, which became an absolute nightmare because once you have, I mean, we had, so what did we have? We had 60 horses, 60 stunt riders. We had, I think, 50 or so stuntmen. We had 400 extras. Wow. And then obviously a crew of about 120. So we were in that field for about 16, 17 days. And after day one, once you've had the horses go through that field and 400 people, churned. I mean, it became an absolute nightmare to, to work in. Um, <laughs> it was a tough, it was tough on the assistants. They all, all the crew did an amazing job on that um, to keep yeah. us going. Um, I totally forgot the question that you asked me. Uh, 
um, the way that the camera is in so close to the actors and the action, it's, you know, how was that even done with yeah. so many people there? I mean, you know, we, we, we were planning a lot. We did a lot of planning. Mick, Mick and I, uh, we did a lot of prep where we worked out all the things that we wanted to do. Um, and one of the, one of the ideas was that we want to, you know, we both said, we don't just want to see a battle because seeing a battle when you don't care about anyone, if you just see a random battle that becomes very boring very quickly. So how can we make this more interesting? So we decided to make this all about Jon Snow and his journey and seeing it kind of through his perspective. So we naturally wanted the camera to be close to him and, mm -hmm. and it all becomes about uh, how do we choreograph this to be interesting and exciting and powerful and dangerous, but without actually being dangerous for the actors or mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. for any of the crew. And obviously once you have horses involved and all of that stuff that becomes very intricate. And so, you know, it, it took a lot of planning Um but, you know, we're surrounded by a great team on Game of Thrones. We have amazing, um, from from visual effects to special effects to stunts to the art department, um, every, 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 every department is, you know, on the top of their game. So, yeah. you know, we, we, yeah. we can figure all of this stuff out and then, you know, have the ability to make an episode like this. Well, like I said, it was absolutely phenomenal to watch. And at the very end of it as well, just the, the pan up from the drone shot from above with Jon Snow being surrounded by carnage. Mm. I just went, this is, is you know, you, you get, when you watch something and you get you know, the hair in the back of your neck stands up. That's what happened to me when I watched that. It was incredible. Hats off. That's Fantastic great. work. That's great. Thank you. And it wasn't just me that recognized this as being such a good um, piece of filming. You also got another accolade because of that, did you? I was nominated and actually won the ASC award for that one. The American wow. Society of Cinematographers wow. Award, yeah. And, and how did that one feel? I mean, that felt great. I have to say that felt, <laughs> that felt great. Um, there's, a, there's a bittersweet story to that because I wanted to hand that episode in for the Emmys. But um, right. this was like the most anticipated episode of the season and David and Dan and HBO really didn't want to give anything away. They didn't want to have any dangers of anything being shown or being able to be shown to the public before it aired. So I actually wasn't allowed to hand it in to the Emmys. Wow. Because um, I think I would have probably gotten an, a nomination at least for that one. Yeah. Um, yeah but it, so I was a bit, it was a bit, it, I was a bit sad when, when I couldn't do that. So getting the AC award was very nice. Uh, but also on top of that is, you know, the AC is, you know, to be, to be nominated by your peers, you know, by actual cinematographers, you know, people who do your job, you know, mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. most of them probably better than me. Um, to be nominated, to be nominated by them, you know, that's a huge honor for any VP. And I think that's, that's what makes that so special. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, I mean, the interesting thing for me when you say that is they also all know the amount of hard work effort that goes into creating any scene, never mind say a scene so visually stunning and impactful, like I said, in regards to that. But how, how much work is involved typically in setting up a scene? I mean, I noticed in regards to a number of the episodes within Game of Thrones, they all seemed quite dark. That's going to be very difficult to, to get set up from the cameras with lighting and such like that, I imagine, yeah? I mean, you know, I don't think it was dark. It was just, um, it was right for the show. <laughs> Oh, no, I don't mean dark. Sorry, I don't mean in that way. But it's right for the show because you're being lit by flame, let's just say. Yes. That's difficult from from a, a typical studio environment. That's very difficult to be able to film in, I think. No, I think it's, I mean, you know, it's, no, I think it's, you know, it, you approach it the same way. Um, okay. We obviously, we wanted to make sure that it has a very real touch to it. So, you know, um, 
yeah, we spent a lot of time lighting it and and giving it that Game of Thrones kind of feel and, and look. Um, and have you ever had the whole scene set up and then the director to come around and say, no, I want to shoot it from the other side? <laughs> I have had that. I have had that before. Yeah, that, that must be tough. Uh, that was tough, yeah. But that was, you know, I was working with a director who wasn't very nice. He, okay. he, and he wasn't doing that for any particular reason. It was uh, only to, okay. um, it was only to, it was only to um, stress me out. Uh, mm, lovely. Or to punish me for something. <laughs> that, was, that was a, you know, those are unusual things that happen sometimes. Um, you know, but there's also for sure. there's people in this industry sometimes who aren't very nice. So that can happen. And I presume it's a high pressure role. I mean, you've got to deliver. You've got a amount of people that are all there on set. No mind set actors, but everything else there, you got to deliver. I mean, does it take times that you kind of go, I'm not sure if we can deliver this on time? Or do you always approach it like you always had by going, okay, this is a job. What have we got to do? I've got my formula. Let's get it done. Knock it out of the park. Mm. I think that very much depends on the job and the people that you're working with. I mean, look, you always want to deliver, you know, you always want to deliver and I always want to deliver in time and I want to deliver, you know, good, good stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, you know, part of my job, part of a DP's job is also to be responsible and to be uh, respectful and to be, um, you know, truthful. So if I, you know, if I think that something is actually not achievable within the time frame or whatever that's been given, then I will say that mm -hmm. because, mm -hmm. you know, I will always try my best to, to do things. But if I know that it's already unachievable before we even started, I think it's irresponsible not to bring that up. But, you know, this industry is like, you know, you, you work, this is a teamwork industry, so you're working with people and no matter, you know, you all have to work together to make something work and to achieve something. And, you know, we all work within certain constraints, but if we all work together, then we can make it happen. So, yeah, to, for that Te to happen. Teamwork yeah. makes the dream work. <laughs> well, exactly, yeah. Yeah. Um, I suppose, yeah, and I think moving on then from that, you know, another project that you worked on, which is a mammoth project, from my eyes anyway, as the viewer watching it, was Justice League. Like, mm -hmm. how complex a project was that, and how long did it take to do from start to finish? Yeah, that was complex. Now, the funny story about this is that, for example, you know how I said that I got Game of Thrones because of Sherlock? Uh -huh. I got Justice League because of Game of Thrones. Uh -huh. Okay, and and okay. I, I can s literally be like these are like the the three career points in my the three points in my career that have had an impact is like Sherlock, you know, got me Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones got me um, got me Justice League, and it, and it's literally as simple as that. And I just always have to laugh at that because I'm, it's again nothing that I ever expected to happen. You know, I've obviously always known of Zack Snyder. I've always loved his films. I've always been a fan of his visual style, um, mm -hmm. but I never even thought of myself shooting with Zack. And then when he came to London to shoot Justice League, I had a phone call from my agent saying Zack wants to meet you. And I, I literally, I remember, I literally, I think I fell off my chair. <laughs> because it was such a random thing out of the blue that I just never even expected. And um, when I went in to see Zach, I actually said to him, Zach, I'm super happy and grateful to be here, but I've got no idea what I'm doing here. Um, wow. You know, this was like, this was one of the biggest budget movies ever. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I know that I had, some, I had done some, bigger stuff then, but nothing of that scale. Um, but he literally, you know, we got on well and he, I got a job and I found out later that, you know, they had interviewed a lot of 
big name DPs. And he one day said to his assistant, who's the, who's the guy who did my favorite game of Thrones episode again, put him on top of the pile. <laughs> and that was me. So it was just totally, ra- <laughs> totally random. Um, Amazing. And so that's and what that about. And how, how, lo- how long did that take then, I suppose, from start to finish? So, like, was it a, a, I know it wasn't a year, but was it two years? Was it three years in total from the time that you got the, the first meeting with Zach to no, no, release it was, day? It was like, I think, um, I'm trying to think now because I was in, I was in LA when I had the phone call that I got the job, which was only a couple of weeks after I met Zach. Um, mm-hmm. And I was doing the color grade on Game of Thrones. And I think that was probably in around February or something. So, you know, and then we, the month later in March, I think we probably started prepping. I can't wow. remember exactly the dates, but um, uh, it, was, it was pretty quick. And also as well, you you got to move back up with Jason Momoa, or did you did you work with Jason Momoa with Game of Thrones? He was gone at that stage, was he? When you and you he was on that stage. Think. We didn't we never Aya. met on Aya. on Game of Thrones, but he knew of me from Thrones, and I obviously knew him from watching him. And um, yes, yeah, that was really great to get to meet Jason, and uh, he's a great guy. We we had a lot of fun on Justice League. Yeah, it it, it looked like an absolutely immense movie not only to like to watch from my point of view but i often think you know how much work has gone in and even the small little nuances here and there mm. there's a lot of work gone in to create these things so you know i think it's it, it, it's fascinating and again hats off to you because as you say you know you, you you never dreamed of having that but all of a sudden you're there and you've got the humility to say i don't know what i'm doing here Yet what you've produced was phenomenal. Hats off on that again. That was think, amazing. You know, on a film like this, I mean, you know, I've got to give all the credit to um, Zach. You know, Zach is an amazing filmmaker. He's a super nice guy. He's, as a director, he's incredible. He knows exactly what he wants. He's an amazing artist. He, he showed me, when I first met him, he showed me this huge book, which was the storyboards that he had drawn for the film. Okay. You know, he's a, he, he, he can draw incredibly well. Um, he's just a really interesting, great artist. And he's, he, he knows what he wants, but he's also very open to new ideas. And it was just a, a really enjoyable experience to work with him. You know, I learned a lot from him and we had a lot of fun. And um, it, the whole thing turned into a bit of a nightmare, obviously, as everyone knows afterwards. Um, and it took about four years for our version of the film to come out, but it did come out in the end. And so, yeah, I'm just, I'm glad they did. Yeah, it was worth the wait. It was, it was a fantastic, uh, movie to watch. I mean, I watched it with my kids and, uh, they loved it. And, um, in the back of my mind, I was like, yeah, I can't wait. No, to actually ask the guy who was involved in this. (laughs) And I've done that so I can tell them the stories in relation to that. (laughs) Thank you for the information on that. Um, Something I want to touch on actually here, Fabian, which is I think something that you started to do in the last recent years, and just with, with your successes to date, you know, you you kind of want to help and encourage the next generation of filmmakers. I mean, you mentioned that you go back to Denmark and you do a, a master's there with the students. Like, tell us about you know this side of your life and the giving back to the younger generation in the film industry. Mm-hmm. That's great. I mean. I mean, that's something that's always been very close to my heart. I've I've always been, I always said to myself from early on that if I ever get to a point where I can give something back or where I can help people, I would do that as much as possible. Um, And so I started sort of doing that off my own back I think it was around Sherlock time, actually, 2012. Wow, okay. Um, 2013, when I started to um, actually speak to people and and encourage people to ask questions and get people onto set with me. And I've been doing that since then, but I've I've recently 
a few years ago now started my own um, trainee scheme, which is called um, First Steps Cinematography, and and we, you know, we we um, kind of focus on helping, you know, pu- push diversity, push uh, gender equality. Um, you know, all of those things is something that's very, very, very uh, important to me and has always been important to me. And so um, having that scheme is actually something that's really um, become a big part of my professional career now, I think. I obviously love shooting uh, and I love, I always love shooting, but um, running first steps is something that's that's almost become as important to me now. Hmm. And tell me, what what advice would you give to somebody who wants to get involved in the film industry? Let's just say even to your to your younger self. Let's just say, knowing what you know now and what you've done within your highly successful career. You know, I think this is a very individual industry, and and there is no right or wrong in this industry. I think everybody has to find their own path and, and, and your own way, um, which I know isn't very helpful to say that, but I, I think what does help. And I think that's something that I would definitely, I'm a bit advocate for is I think, first of all, just be yourself, mm-hmm. um, be true to yourself, but also be, show your true self to others because this industry can be quite fake and um, there can be a lot of pretense, but I think, uh, I think honesty and I think honesty and being honest to yourself will always prevail. I think that's a really big thing. I think I've always been, been like that, I think, and it's helped me for sure. Uh, I believe in um, you create your own luck um, and you create your own opportunities. I think you have to, you know, you have to work very hard to get anywhere, to get something. Don't wait for anyone to just give you an opportunity. You have to create those opportunities. Um, Mm -hmm. I think that's very important. And... um, yeah, I think those those two things are really, I think, the main thing. I think just be honest and be yourself and and put the work in, you know. And be hu- be hungry. Be hungry, yeah. yeah. You know, I did so many I did so many I did so many years of even when I was a already established DP, you know, when I was shooting those kind of BBC primetime shows. Yes. Even then when I was doing that and I was making, you know, I was making a living and I was pretty consistently working all the time on different shows. Even then I spent most of my weekends doing short films for free, doing music videos for free, doing this and that purely because I wanted to learn more and I wanted to be more diverse and I wanted to um, meet more people and just become a, become better. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think you have, you know, I think you have to do that to to get somewhere. I, I, I think that's great advice. I think it's something that, you know, there's many of people out there in within listeners of the podcast that would look at your story and go, you know what, that's good because I don't want to try and conform to what I think somebody else wants, because then you're not creating your own uniqueness. You're actually just copy and pasting of something else. And that's being true to yourself, as you say. And also, you know, you mentioned earlier on the podcast is always be learning. You're never going to stop learning, but don't be afraid to make mistakes. And if you do make mistakes, take ownership in relation to those mistakes, learn from them and move on. So I think that's, you know, really solid advice. Good. I'm glad you think that too. Yeah, and I suppose, and just as a side note on that, I mean, if any of our listeners were lis- are listening into this and going, you know what, I'd love to get involved in this industry, like 
how 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 would they earn money? Is it something that you have to graft for many years without making any money? Like, what would be? Is it is it a lucrative business for somebody to be in, or is it like an artist in regard to you'll get lucky, you might get a bit of work, you'll get nothing thereafter? Would you? Is it possible to even put a, a pay scale as a career on the the role? Absolutely. I mean, you know, this 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 is definitely an industry the way you can make good money. You know, obviously you're freelance, so you, you know, you don't work every day. Mm -hmm. You don't have securities like health insurance or, you know, um, pensions or anything. That's all something that you have to do yourself. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, you can certainly, you know, it's changed nowadays as well. I mean, you know, when I, when, in, when I started, you know, you had to work for free these days. You know, the trainees that I bring on, on board, for example, with my scheme, they all get paid, you know. Okay. Um, and obviously you start small and it bec becomes more and more, but you do get paid and uh, you you can make, you know, you can make a living. So it's a, and it's, it's a very interesting industry. It's a great industry. It's, a, it's, can be great fun you know so i remember when i was working when i was um just before i went to denmark you know mm -hmm. you know i was working two jobs to be able to to be able to go to that film school and then my parents helped me a little bit i was lucky enough that my parents helped me too um and at the same time i was working for free on short films just to learn stuff so you know it's never easy mm -hmm. but anything's possible with the right mindset well i think it's i think i mean i think the right mindset is definitely something that you need but then you also need luck you know you need you need you need to meet the right people at the right time mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. And you have to work for that to happen too. That's what I'm saying. You have to make your own luck. But obviously, there's also other luck involved that you can't really influence as much. I mean, and you know, I always say, I was so lucky in my career too. I did put the work in. There's no doubt about that. I had the right attitude. There's no doubt about that. I did everything that I could physically possibly do myself to help me make it but i also needed something else to make that happen and 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 that's something that i can't influence and that's just luck i mean the fact that you know sherlock became so successful the emmy nomination david and dan liking that show i mean those are all things that you can't take for granted would necessarily happen that was lucky that those yeah. things happened that way. Had Sherlock been done maybe three, four years before that, maybe it hit, wouldn't have hit, you know, the zeitgeist as much. And it mm -hmm. maybe it wouldn't have been so successful. You just never know. You know, there's so many things that have to, have to align, you know. Luck and timing as well, I think, is the key one there. Because, you know, you can get lucky, but you can get lucky at the wrong time as well. You know, or you can get lucky at the right time, as you say. If, you know, if Sherlock was made five years beforehand, then, you know, the, the showrunners, showrunners with Game of Thrones may not have actually had that on their radar. If it was made later, you would have missed the boat. I would have missed so, the boat. So it's just, it, it's all about those kind of timings. And you have to meet the right people, meet the right directors, you know, pe people that you get on with and people that will take you onto other things and and so there's there's loads of and obviously that's something that you can influence but not entirely you know there's always something that's in someone else's hands so mm, absolutely absolutely um look i think that has been a really really fascinating uh, conversation for me fabian i've loved hearing the backstory in regards to you know your stepping stones to success and obviously the uh, different episodes that you were involved in and your thought process behind each of them. I have one question for you before we go to our final break. Mm -hmm. Are you working on House of Dragon season two? I'm not. <laughs> ah! I'm shooting I'm shooting a movie right now, uh, but actually we're not shooting right now. We started filming, but then we got shut down because of the um, the, the writer's the writer strike, strike and the, and the yeah. actor's strike. 
But you did work on, on House of Dragons season one, didn't you? I did. I did. Yeah. Another, another, another great show. All right. Um, look, I'm going to take our final break and I'll come right back. I've got three questions I ask every single guest and I'm really looking forward now to hearing your answers. So Fabian, we'll be right back after this. If you're enjoying this episode of the podcast, why not jump over to iTunes or Spotify and listen to the back catalogue that we have of some great episodes where we talk about photography, gear, and some excellent guests along the way. Thanks very much for listening and for watching. We'll see you on the next one. And you're very welcome back to the final part of this fascinating episode this evening. And I'm really excited now, Fabian, to hear your answers to the staple three questions that I ask every single guest. And the first question I ask is, everybody has a funny photography story. What's yours? <laughs> okay, so, I mean, there's... Uh, I mean, there's countless funny ones and embarrassing ones, and <laughs> most of them are embarrassing. To be fair, yeah. <laughs> but uh, but this is this is funny, but it's also uh, in a way quite telling. And so I thought I'll I'll tell you this one uh, okay. because it kind of ties in what I said earlier about how these early days um, were the most creative and, and, and most fun. Um, mm -hmm. So when I was doing Sherlock, uh, Scandal and Belgravia, which was that, that episode that became sort of the more famous one, Paul and I were talking about doing lots of transitions, interesting transitions from scene to scene. And there was this one scene where Sherlock is working on a case on a field and then it was cutting to him being asleep and um, we were thinking about an interesting transition to that to that story uh, to that scene and years before that um, 12 years before that in film school in England um, I was shooting a music video with Mark Wordsworth and um, for a band that we knew and it was a one take music video and at the end the singer uh, the, the, the video starts with the singer waking up in bed and it's a close-up on him lying in bed and he's got the duvet on him and he takes the duvet off and gets up and then this video starts all the t uh, for four minutes and it ends with him standing doing a performance and then behind him this mattress comes up and the duvet comes up and we end on the same shot that we started with. Um and the show, it looks like him lying in bed, basically. Mm -hmm. And there was a very simple trick where we basically had, you know, it was on the Steadicam and I was I was actually operating the Steadicam at the time and we were sort of on a wide shot and I was pushing in closely and once I got to a medium shot, there was two guys on the floor with the mattress and as I got to a certain size, they brought the mattress up behind him into shot and two other people pulled up the blanket next to him so it looked like he was lying in bed. in bed and it was yeah, a very yeah. simple idea that worked very very well and so I remember that for Sherlock and I said Paul why don't we do this this was such a cool thing that we did um, and you know Sherlock would be standing on in the middle of the field and suddenly this mattress would come up behind him and he would pull up a duvet and he would fall asleep and, and then we are suddenly in his apartment as he wakes up that would be a really nice transition. And Paul loved the idea. And so we we suggested the idea to everybody. And and this is it's a good example and a funny example of how once you step into the professional world uh, and away from sort of indie filmmaking, how a very mm -hmm. simple idea can be taken and made into something much more complicated. And so I... I always expected, okay, that's what we'll do. We'll be with Benedict on the field and there's going to be a guy behind him and just push the mattress up into shots and someone else will pull the blanket up and that would be it. But because mm -hmm. suddenly on a, on a big TV show with many different departments and all sorts of things, it became much bigger. And so when I was, I remember we were shooting on the field somewhere in Wales and this truck turn up and 
special effects had built a hydraulic machine <laughs> with a huge double bed on it that wow. was meant to do the same effect. And, and it was this huge thing, you know, that they, they, they built this whole thing for probably lots of money. They drove it down to Wales in this van. It took about 15 guys to carry this massive, <laughs> super heavy thing rig. onto the rig, onto the field. And I was standing there thinking, this is crazy. But anyway, <laughs> here we are, we're doing it. And I'm on the camera with Benedict and we call action. Nothing happens. The hydraulics didn't work. <laughs> and it just makes me laugh every single time because it's such a perfect example of how something very, very simple in this industry can be turned into something much more uh, difficult and much more expensive, um, mm -hmm. even though it can be achieved so easily and so, so, so cheaply. And so in the end, we actually did the same thing that we did in the music videos, which was with two people just putting the mattress up and it worked wow. great, and that's what's in the, in, in Sherlock. Um, wow. I, O o over engineered and over complicated a simple idea to let so far that it, that it didn't actually work that's well, that's what happens wow it's not that funny a story <laughs> but it's it's um it's funny to me and it will always it's I always remember that absolutely yeah it, it, and you know i think it's quite interesting to kind of hear a backstory in relation to it so people who have watched the episode now know what was behind the story and also where the idea originally uh, came from as well from yourself and mark back in the day. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant story. Um, okay, the next one, and I think this is one that our listeners will probably either be bamboozled with or will drool over, which is, what gear do you shoot with? I mean, so I've always been, I'm not a very te technical person. Um, okay. I never have been. You can give me, I've, I always used to say, give me any kind of camera, as long as I, when I look through it, it looks good, I'm happy. Yeah. Saying that, um, and I told you earlier, I, I did my apprenticeship at ARRI when I was 16. Uh -huh. And I'm from Munich, and I, I think the ARRI cameras are just wonderful. And I've, I I used to shoot a lot on, on, um, on, on the ARRI film cameras, um, and I love them, and since we've turned into digital, I've been using the Alexa, the Ari Alexa the most, um, mm -hmm. whether it was the D20 or then the Alexa and the Alexa Mini LF or the 65 or uh, now the Ari 35. Um, I've used all of them and I love those cameras. And um, I try and shoot film when I can, but... Uh, I, I always tend to go to Ari. It's, there, there's just I'm Bavarian. Ari's Bavarian. There's something about there's a there's a there's a um, kind of a emotional connection, connection there, synergy. you know, yeah. to Ari. And Absolutely. Stuff. And and you know what? I have never once had the opportunity to hold an Ari camera, but I have seen people use them, and I've seen the results. And I'm sure that if I was ever in the same position as you, I'd go, I want the best, and Ari do deliver that. So it's well, great that you're from Munich. And in London, you should let me know, and then we'll go down to Ari. Oh, wow. And yeah, I'd love it. Play with all of them for the day. <laughs> yeah, probably be, I'd probably be last with all the buttons, and else I'd probably break one. One of the two would happen, but I know I'd enjoy it. But that's brilliant. Yeah, thank you for that. That'd be great. Um, okay, and then the, the, the final question that I have for you is a regular segment on the podcast, and it's one that features a thing called a VSP. It's a very solid product. A product you won't leave home without and you'd put your name in it if you could. What's yours, Fabian? I, I really have no idea. There's no, there is no product as such. I would say... Um, A good attitude is, <laughs> is a product I would not want to go without. 
Um, <laughs> well, you know what? That's a first. And I actually think it's a very, very important product as well to have. So, you know, you, 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 if you've got an attitude that you can get something done, you'll get it done. If you've got an attitude that you can't get something done, then you won't get it done. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's yeah. a good product. I agree with you. Yeah, good one. Good. You've broken the mold on that one, but I actually think it's a very good product, which is very interesting. Cool. Um, so, Fabian, that has been an absolutely fascinating conversation. Um, I've really, really enjoyed all aspects of learning about you and how you know you've gotten to where you are. Many congratulations on your achievements to date, and I love the fact that you're now giving back to the community as well, and you know helping the next generation filmmakers to come along in their uh, in their own journeys. For far as your point is, what's next for you? Uh, well, first of all, thank okay. you, for, thank you for having me. First of all, um, you're very welcome. That was great, and I very much enjoyed that. And um, what's next? Uh, I well, I'm shooting. I'm currently not shooting because of the strike. We've been shut down, but I'm currently shooting um, Venom Three. Um, wow, the Tom Hardy superhero uh, movie. So we we. Uh, we were shooting for about four weeks before we got shut down. Wow. And so we're currently waiting to, um, to start up again. I'm, again. I'm actually, I'm talking to you from Lisbon cause I'm in Lisbon for a commercial. Um, so I managed to get a commercial in, in between, but we're, we're, we're just waiting to see what happens. And as soon as they've made a deal, we're gonna, uh, you know, start, start up again. Well, my, my son will be absolutely delighted to hear that news because he is a big fan of the uh, Venom series movies. Okay. So I'll tell him that uh, I was talking to the guy who is now making Venom 3. I think his eyes will be as wide as uh, a big road. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Fabian, uh, where can people find more information on you if they want to look you up and see You know your vast array of accolades and you know clips and show reels and such like that have you a website yes i do i mean that's all very boring i doubt that anybody wants to see that but it's uh my website is um fabian wagner dop.com i think um okay. and let me actually i just wanted to say one more thing because that's something that's really um that's one of the nicest things that's happened to me in my career. And um, one of the nicest moments. So, you know, I mentioned um, Sam Donovan earlier, who was the director that I did lots of short films with at the film school in England. Mm -hmm. And um, so I was shooting all his short films. We became very, very close friends, still very good friends. And I'm the, god the godfather to, to his son and, and things like that. And, um, but we obviously, he became a director, I became a DP, our kind of after film school, even though we were best friends and we were always in touch, um, you know, our careers kind of took different paths for a while. And um, for years and years, we managed, we, we tried to work together, but it just never happened. And then in 2019, he, um, we reunited for the first time professionally and we did the crown together. Okay. And that was the first time we worked together kind of professionally because up to then, even though we were probably talking most days for 15 years, but the, the last time we actually shot together was doing short films. And that was one of the nicest things that I've ever done. Um, is actually, you know, and it's, it, it, it's doing that and, and, it, and it's just such a nice, thing to have and the thought and it's something for everyone to understand I think as well when you get into this industry is that the people that you meet early on that you know you go to film school with and that you do those all these crazy things with for free and for fun you know those are the people that you're going to work with you know in 20 years time and maybe even on a great show like The Crown and so it was just a very nice you know it was great when we were shooting that show, we were both so happy every single day being on set together uh, and suddenly actually doing that, that we had done 15 years beforehand, but we were just dreaming of doing it 
for money and with like you know the proper way you know and that's Mm -hmm. something that that was very very nice and that was one of the nicest moments in my career um was doing that Uh, and uh and I, and I think, and you know, thank you for sharing that, because I think that's a very interesting point as well, which I think is applicable to many people, you know, not only in professional, but also from all walks of life is the people that you meet. You don't know who you're going to meet tomorrow that's going to have a big impact in your life, either tomorrow, a year, two years, five years down the line. And these things can happen. And I believe in things happen for a reason. And, you know, you met up with Sam back then. You started, you know, doing things for free. It comes full circle. I bet it was like hanging out with your best buddy and all of a sudden there you are making an episode of The Crown and you're being paid for it. That's exactly how it was. <laughs> yeah. Great. yeah, yeah, class, class. Fabian, thank you very, very, very much for taking your time out of your busy schedule to have a chat with me. I'm sorry it took me so long to finally get the uh, the conversation going, but I'm delighted now that we did. Uh, I've really, really enjoyed it, and I'm sure that our listeners as well will enjoy your story and take quite a lot from the insights that you've given. That's great. Thank you. And thanks for having me. And if anybody wants to reach out or has any questions, feel free to email me on First Steps Cinematography. There's an Instagram page and the website. And um, we're there's a team of us and we're always very, very open to um, helping and answering questions. And yeah. That's brilliant. Thank you very, very much for that. Um, Fabian, I sign off every podcast with a phrase in Irish, uh, which is bye for now. So I'll sign off to say from me to you, thank you very much and strong the fall. Thank you. Hey guys, if you dig what you're hearing, why don't you jump over to iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Give us a five star rating and don't forget to share with your friends. With all that done, we'll see you next week. And remember, keep shooting.